You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. When you look down a double barrel shotgun with just a bulletproof vest on and all you've got is your sunglasses on, I, it was quite gnarly, man. I thought, oh, shit, I might do what have I said yes to. And he just went poof, poof, poof blew me backwards, scarred all my chest. One of the bullets went through my arm and knocked me to the floor. And I was just like, oh, buzzing my tits off. It was fucking brilliant. I'm not an hard guy at all. I can't stand fighting. I hate confrontation. But that guy, yeah, did what he was doing was doing my head in. So I just chucked him out and then he came badging back. He pushed the door back in. I turned around and he had one of those, it was like an oval plastic thing with a thing you push out and there's a blade. And he just went, and just bang. Sliced down there on my chest, and then I didn't feel it. And I turned around, I saw my girlfriend at the time, she just went, ah, it's just screaming, crying, fell to the floor. And I was like, what? And then it was blood everywhere, and I thought, oh, shit. We were in a hotel room, and we were going to have a prostate massage. Legal high, you know, and the setting was set. We were in a hotel room. Don't forget, you know yourself, behind the camera, the sound people, there's a the director, the producer, the this, this, that. And then we had to lay on the... He had a single bed there, a single bed there. We had to lay there. And they said, right, these ladies are going to come in now. So these ladies walked in, they had these cat, cat's eye glasses on, and they just sit there, these little condoms they put in their fingers. <laughs> Me and Dave sat there, and they... <laughs> I was like, no, oh my God. She, I'm not doing it again, no chance. Ben we're on. Today's guest, we've got Matthew Pritchard. How are you, brother? Good, man. Very good. Very Thanks good. for coming on the show. Yeah, no worries, man. Thank you for inviting me. Legend, Dirty Sanchez. Now you are a extreme athlete, dirty vegan, done loads of things now. Been in the industry for nearly 20 years, or over 20 years, is it? Uh, over 20 years. Yeah, is it over 20 years you've been in the industry? Uh, or was it 2003 it kicked off? What, in the, t in the TV yeah. world? Uh, yeah, 2001. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 20 years. Yeah. Bang on, 20 years, bang on. How's that for you? Yes, yeah, it's, it's good. I mean, when you first go into it, you know, when you're young, it's like that. You know, you'd think you'd never be on TV and and then you get a deal with MTV to go on, you know, MTV, anything like that is massive when you're that age. And and starting that journey with MTV with Dirty Sanchez and stuff was, was amazing, really good. But it's not until later on in quite, uh, 10 years later or maybe a little bit earlier, that you sort of look back a little bit and realise how naive you were when you go in to make deals and all that kind of stuff and how cutthroat the industry is. And, and uh, I mean, that's just what it, I think it's just like the record industry, all those, you know, they, we, we got told, you know, because we, we wanted to get an agent and we were advised not to get an agent. Now I know why we were advised not to get an agent because they knew they'd screwed loads more money out of them. Um, but anyway, it's been, I, I mean, I can't moan. It's been, it's been brilliant, what a laugh. I mean, we beat the system. We got paid to travel around the world with your mates to get drunk and have a laugh. So, I mean, that's all you ever, fucking yeah. great. That's all you ever want as a kid. Yeah. You also sailed around the Atlantic there, which is a phenomenal achievement, so well done. I was following the journey through that. With road, 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 road. Yeah. I was gonna say, people yeah. think the same cheat, didn't <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you rode around the Atlantic, which is a phenomenal thing, brother. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. I was following the journey there. Yeah. Um, from I think you were over 15 stone and then you lost some amount of weight. We'll touch on all that later on in the interview. Yeah. But I'll always go back to the start with my guest, brother. Where you grew up and how it all began. I grew up in Cardiff. I got I was born in Heath Hospital. Got uh, in Cardiff City. Uh, and I lived I well, I lived like Wolf Park Lake, which is quite a posh area. We weren't posh, but just 
but he said, well, it was like a nice area, but it was just off by the lake. But it's a lovely, lovely place to live. Got brought up there. I think we were living by Grampy and stuff, my parents at the time. And then we, I was lit, pretty much got brought up in the Roth area of Cardiff, uh, next to Albany Road, City Road, loads of shops and stuff, really close to town. Um, you know, I've got two, I've got two brothers, uh, mother, father, and um, yeah, got brought up, kind of went to school, went to Welsh school. I mean, my first language is Welsh. All my family, parents, everyone speak Welsh, so I, I learned to speak Welsh first. Uh, before I even went to school, and then I learned English when I went to school. Although I went to Welsh school as well, they still they had English, everything was in Welsh, but we did have English classes. And obviously, the kids in the, the playground speaking English as well. So that's where I learned how to speak English. Um, I went to Ascot Brayrug, then I went to Glant. No, I went to Brintav first, Ascot Brayrug, then I went to Glantav. And yeah, I mean that's I mean like, back in the day, it was simple, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Life was simple. Complete. I see some of the kids these days. You know, they, you don't see them on the streets having a laugh and playing around, and stuck with their tablets and stuff. But that's just how it is now. But we, yeah, we just used to play on the street. Me and my brother messing around. Good little upbringing. It's fun. How were you at school? Were you high part? Were you intelligent? How? What was your? <laughs> well, I wasn't intelligent. <laughs> 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 but I'm cool with that. I mean, I mean, it's, it's quite like my mother said. You know, you know, he, he's not. I'm not very academic, but I can do this. And uh, you know, with me, it was, it's, it's like teaching an elephant to climb a tree. It's not going to happen. You know, I, I just wasn't interested. Wasn't interested in school. Hated school. Uh, spent most time looking out the window, daydreaming. And it was actually on my report in school that Matthew spends a lot of time day- daydreaming. Uh, what I was daydreaming about, I don't know, but. I think it was mostly daydreaming about being outside school and not actually inside. Uh, I did enjoy doing art classes, enjoyed the odd bit of sport, but when, even when I played rugby, I used to spend half the time picking the grass and the flowers rather than getting stuck in. Uh, but yeah, school for me, I just, I just, I just wasn't, I just wasn't that interested, interested in just cool. Yeah. I think it's the majority just, of the kids though, it's the same old shit though. Sit at a desk, crunch yeah. numbers, learn geography, learn history. But people, it's the individuality and the creativity that you want in life to keep creating. But it can be damaging. We spoke earlier, it's just the constant thinking, constantly trying to think of the next move, like chess players. But it's just, it's like playing chess in a fucking war zone. It, it, it is. And I, I wonder, but when I was in school, that's when I picked up skateboarding. And that was, that was me then. Like uh, I got, well, I managed to persuade my because I used to hang out in the streets, and uh, my friend got a skateboard, like a really rubbish skateboard. Oh, I just loved it. But so rather than hanging out in the streets, I was actually skateboarding whilst hanging out in the streets. And I asked my mother if I could have uh, a skateboard. No, too dangerous. And I thought, oh, damn. But then I, I just constantly kept using my mate's skateboard. And then I actually went, I remember going out on the street in my road, number 10 my road, we used to live in Cardiff. And I said, look, ma'am, look what I can do. And I showed what I could do. And then after quite a bit of convincing, uh, I had a paper round and a milk round at the time. Uh, she said, well, you can have one, but you have to pay for it yourself. So I saved up my paper round and a milk round. Uh, and I bought myself, uh, actually, first of all, I got, I got a pacer, hogs, now I had pace, pace of wheels and I had, oh, I can't remember what the board was anyway, but I had these pink wheels, they were great. And then I bought a Vision Psycho stick, which was my first proper skateboard. And I took so much time over putting the grip tape and made spider web grip tape out of it. And that was me then, I was hooked. As far as I can say, I couldn't shit about school. All I gave a shit about was skateboarding. And as soon as I came back from school, skate, 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 skate. How were you treated then back in the day with skateboarding? It wasn't as popular as it was now. No, it wasn't popular at all. I mean, uh, so the, yeah, it seems it was the very late eighties, and um, I mean, I there was a shop in town called uh, City Surf. Sadly, it's, the City Surf was actually just behind us there. We moved to this shop by there, and, and it moved to there as well, but. You know, with the internet and everything, people buying stuff online. Unfortunately, it went, um, it went down. But it was with us for 30 years. And uh, back then, the, 
that's where we used to get our skateboards from and and they supported the scene big time and, and, and Jono, uh, the guy who owned it, supported me a lot as well. So I'm really grateful of him for, for doing that. He always gave me cheap boards and, and stuff. And it was, it was a good time. It was, it, was so, it was such a small sport and not many people did it. That when you did actually see a skateboarder when you were out in town or something, you'd like, oh yeah, what's happening, man? And you were instant friends and you hung out and you did stuff. And if, even if you went, to Bristol or to London or something like that for a day trip, you see another skateboarder. You just hang out like these days. So many people skateboarding, that kind of stuff doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. So it was um, it was a fun time. Is that your passion then? As soon as you found that, is that your one true love, skateboarding? I, as soon as I found skateboarding, that, that that was me. I was I think that was li- literally that was my addiction, mm-hmm. hook, line, and sinker. I, that's all I did. And in the school holidays, on the six weeks off, I just get up really early. And I would not come home until until my mother told me what time I had to be home. Because my, my mother was pretty strict. So, um, and I'd just skate nonstop. That's all I did. And I, and I used to go and, and I met, that's where I met half my friends today. Because we used to go to a place just in town down by there called the Cardiff Banks. And every Saturday, Sunday, if the weather was nice, everyone would congregate there. And that's where I met all my, just all my, I am all my, most of my school friends I didn't really hang out with. I just made new friends through skateboarding. What was the injuries like then? Did that help when you went to Dirty Sanchez? Did you break anything, cuts, grazes? Um, I didn't do too bad. I've never broken touch wood. <laughs> I've never <laughs> broken like a, an arm or a leg or anything, but I've broken like little like, things in my foot or fingers or... I was saying that, I actually fractured my spine. <laughs> but that was, that was two years ago in Dubai, me, I forty eight year old with a twenty five year old mind, yeah, I can still do it and then bang, boom practice spine. Anyway, but back then it was just like a lot of tweaked ankles and stuff and that's all really. A lot of cuts and cross skate. But you don't you do you, you don't give a shit when you're that young. You fall over, back on again. Even when your ankle your ankles didn't even heal properly. I convinced myself that if I bought a freestyle board, a smaller board, that it wouldn't hurt my ankle as much. Where's the logic? Of course it did. But yeah. I still carried on, but... Hey. Did you want to be a stuntman at an early age? What age did you realise you wanted to be a stuntman? Yeah, I wanted to be a stuntman when I was in school. Uh, I remember seeing to the... Because you used to sit down with the careers teacher. I said, what do you want to be when you're older? I said, stuntman. Can you imagine how that was uh, received? Ah, oh, no, I yeah, yeah. it's going to be some man, you want to be a doctor, a nurse, whatever, it, you know, all those kind of jobs, working in an office. No, <laughs> be a stunt man. And that's another reason why I didn't really like school. I didn't want to be any of those things. I just wanted to be a stunt man. And I think skateboarding was pretty much stunt yeah. man-ish. Because, I mean, most of the stuff I did on a skateboard, I really enjoyed jumping big gaps and big down big stairs and stuff, which was, which was quite dangerous. So I'm guessing that was my stunt man. He kind of... St- stuff and then Sanchez come along and well, that, that, that wasn't stunt man that was just daredevil <laughs> uh-huh. did you ever visualise in anything the law of attraction back then that to believe you wanted to be a stunt man and then kind of everybody try to fit you into a small box and tell you you couldn't do it to then eventually becoming a stunt man yeah I mean, when you when you say you were going to be a stunt man back then there was loads of naysayers they'd always say mm-hmm. that, that. So if, it, it was different back then if you said that no all right, what's that what we going to do? Well, let's let's see if we can do some research and see where we can get you. There's got to be a stunt school somewhere you can go to and learn. But back then, it was just you classed as, well, you might be a stuntman. <laughs> only, only people in Hollywood do stuff like that. And I always wanted to be a Hollywood stuntman because I'd see cult Seavers on TV. I'd jump off a tower building and break my neck and legs. And I was like, yeah. And, uh, well... Didn't happen, did it? <laughs> <laughs> so, but well, it did happen. Sanchez was my, yeah, Sanchez was my stuntman days, I guess. Yeah, well, it's kind I mean, of it stuntman stuff. I wasn't in not, movies doing it, but yeah, it's fucking still doing it on MTV. It's not too bad. No, it's all right. How did Dirty Sanchez come about? Very popular show back in two thousand three, was it? And it started two thousand and one. And me, me and Dayton were. You know, me and Dave best mates hanging about skateboarding I met him at the Cardiff Banks what I was on about earlier um, he got a video camera and we were filming we just 
we just did lots of filming of us skateboarding and uh, currently at the time uh, Bama Gator was doing a show called um, CKY uh, Can't Kill Yourself it was and we were just happening to be doing filming as well it was just one of those things and we got loads we filmed loads of big skateboarders in the UK the Ben Lade and Ali Khans uh, Matt Davis uh, me and Dayton had a skate section as well so it was always me versus him if I did something, he had to do it. We'd always play and pranks on one another. And we thought, brilliant. Mother. And we, Pancho was in it as well. And he was always falling asleep. So we were filming him, sleeping, and fucking about with him and doing what we normally do with Panch. And then we knew of a guy called Dan Joyce, who um, was always, we'd turn up at the skate comps and he was like the food cake that always did. And we thought, he'd be great for the video. Let's ask him, what do you want to part? Yes, let's do it. So we did some filming with him. So it was like a, a mixture of skateboarding, pranks, uh, but a com it's like a comedy skateboard mix. Like, and uh, we put it, and it, and it was at the end then, it was gonna finish with, um, well, the main thing was Dan Joyce having a shit in his hand at a Cardiff beauty spot, not far from my house now, and putting the shit in his face. And that was big back then. I mean, you can see that on the internet every day now, but back then it was just, pff, people were like, you what? He did what? So like, yeah, it was on the video. And then we finished the, 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 the video with me and Dayton having a fight in Lennox Lewis's gym. And we put the edit together, called Pressure vs. Dayton, and um, it just was one of the most talked about skate videos of the time. And CKY was out as well. And then Jackass came on the, TV, MTV America, and I think then MTV UK wanted a similar kind of show and they and I was working for Globe Skate Shoes at the time, I was a team manager uh, for the skate team for a distribution company called Double Overhead and I got a phone call off a woman called Martha Delap from MTV, a talent, <laughs> a talent scout and she said, oh can you come in for a meeting? We'd like to do, a, we'd possibly like to do a TV show with you. And I thought, it's just Dane winding me up for something. He got some woman to phone me up, but no, it was her. So I phoned Dane up, told him. We went for a meeting, we gave him, they gave him the videotape. And then they called us two weeks later, said, can you bring the small guy and Joycey with you? Four of us went for a meeting, that's what Sanchez happened. Did you realise how popular it would be? Or did you just think it was a bit of fun? No. No, no, no. We got honestly, I just this is gonna be one series and that's it. So let's just have a laugh. And then, you know, that's just what's gonna happen. We're just gonna go back to normal jobs for them. I think when you start going out uh and everyone's going, No way, I love your show and it's like, whoa, what's that it just went it just went absolutely crazy. And I think at the time it was MTV's um uh, biggest sold show outside of the UK and and it was their biggest show. So it just took off and it was and then they kept called us up again then said we want to do a second series, then it was a third, then it was the movie and so on and so forth. How did that affect you mentally? A kid skateboarder from Cardiff to then being a household name? Well, from being a hated as skate, because when you were skateboarders back then, nobody liked you. <laughs> you got everyone's ever, just, <laughs> just little scumbags. We had fights with security guards, get off our building, stop skating, you know, stop doing this, stop doing that. Wouldn't let us into pubs and, and, and nightclubs and stuff because we were dirty skateboarders. Uh, but then when MTV come along, and the show come out and it was, like, phew, it was big time. All of a sudden, yeah, come drinking in our pub. Come drinking in our my club. And it, but, you know, I, I, it was fucking great. It was free piss. It's like, yay, happy days. <laughs> <laughs> just going in and just, just enjoying it. It was, um, yeah, it was a good time. Really well, but good. Uh, somebody you stood in the ladders and somebody drove right through the ladders. You will had the crash helmet on. Whose idea was that? That was, I think that was the very first stunt we ever did mm -hmm. for Sanchez. <laughs> and I said, because my stuntman days, I've, I've, I've seen it before somewhere. Mm -hmm. I said, I'd love to do that because it looks good. Don't get away, you're not going to be, it's not painful. It just looks good. 
So I thought, well, Dinks, if we get a ladder, a step ladder, and I stand on top of it, and you get a car, I'll drive underneath fast, and I'll just land on my feet. And he just sort of laughed at me, because he obviously knew different. And uh, we got this, got this car, put it up. Oh, what, what, what do we call that place where we did it? Area 52, we call that place where we did it. Mm-hmm. And he came, I was on top of that. He was coming rolling towards me. I thought, he needs to go faster than that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just, you know, you're up there, you're not going to stop. And it was just too late. And he hit it. Oh, next thing I know, he just fell on my back and then come off. It felt like it broke my neck. And I'm quite glad it happened like that because it was more, it was funnier. I mean, how boring would it be if it went perfect? It would have landed yeah. on my feet and gone, da shit. Mm-hmm. But it went wrong. How so much pressure does it put on you to try and do more extreme every series every prank every stunt does that come a mental pressure with that to try and get more views to try and get more popular popularity uh, it's, it's always I mean it was different back then because we didn't have uh, uh, internet we did have the internet but we didn't have stuff like social media and all that kind of stuff so you, you weren't searching for likes and all that malarkey but personally for me if I was to do a stunt I'd have to do it and the next stunt would have to be tougher than the last stunt so you're always pushing the barrier pushing the barrier because so if you push it that high and you do something that low then you know what is it to the viewer so you, the press I sort of got that I got that with skateboarding as well mate because I like doing this jump of the stairs and if I jump like 10 stairs then people expect me to go 12 stairs 14 stairs get bigger and bigger just to see an improvement but you know I guess with a certain a certain amount of mm-hmm. length it's just yeah you fuck yourself <laughs> and I wasn't getting any younger but we, with with Sanchez as well they, they, of course there was a pressure a mental pressure to keep beating the last stunt uh, and just because I mean you have to don't you because Mm -hmm. to keep people interested and keep people seeing more crazy stuff you have to keep pushing the barriers and I think that's just human nature yeah Uh, I I think we pushed the envelope quite um, it's quite an extreme level I think what was people's reactions to you in Wales first of all to what you were doing People's reactions, what? To Dirty Sanchez, did they accept it or were they thinking? Oh, I mean, everyone, everyone loved it. Yeah. Especially blokes. I mean, it's a bloke thing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, fucking smash a few beers, smashing bottles on your head, doing loads of narcotics, just doing what you want, living life, going bonkers. I said, I mean, as a, most, a lot of women loved it as well, but it's not really a, a woman kind of show isn't seeing a load of men pissing and shitting yeah. on each other and sticking drumsticks up their ass and smashing bottles on their head <laughs> but at the, t- at the time I don't have any Saturday <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah you can see that out there every Friday and Saturday but it was oh man it was just it was just fun and we didn't have a kid in the world we were young we didn't give a shit MTV were paying for everything I let, let's fucking go man we just literally we got the key I opened the door and behind it was a lot of fun. What's the, was, yeah, what's the worst thing you've done? Worst thing I've done? Yeah. Oh, there was, there was, there's quite a few. Mm-hmm. Um, stinging nettles. Jumping in the stinging nettles naked. Me, me, Pancho and Dick wrestling. Uh, literally 12 hours of just... Oh. We, we, we had bumps all over us. Almost, almost an anaphylactic shock, I think it was. I'm just, just like like having the worst bad trip that wouldn't go and, um, and of course all these wives tales that if you put dock leaves on it it goes that doesn't work and then somebody said if you piss on it it goes and me and Dent Dent was in the bath and I'm pissing on him <laughs> just to see if he can get rid of it pouring vinegar on him and we were all just we were just doing anything to try and get rid of it it just, ugh, it just looked like a wrong scene, man. If somebody walked into that bathroom at that time, they would have been like, whoa, what the hell's going on there? But um, yeah, that was that was one thing that was bad. Uh, and getting shot to Point Blank Range in Prague. I had a bulletproof vest on. Um, guy had a shotgun. There was a camera on the floor filming up at me and it was cameras behind the gun as well. 
And uh, when you look down the double barrel shotgun with just a bulletproof vest on and all you've got is your sunglasses on, I, it was quite gnarly, man. I thought, oh, shit, I might do what I said yes to. And he just went poof, poof, blew me backwards, scarred all my chest. One of the bullets went through my arm and knocked me to the floor. And I was just like, oh, buzzing my tits off. It was fucking brilliant. And I, I remember saying, and then the cameraman came up to me and went, oh, can you do it again? I forgot to press record. <laughs> I said, you are? I said, the, the, the camera on the floor, he didn't record it. And he's like, no, oh my God. She, I'm not doing it again, no chance. And the guy who shot me, I, I, there is no way I'm doing that again. <laughs> and he, he just walked off, but there's that. There's, there's loads of things, man, I just can't. The paintball was sore. Paintball? That is sore. Did you just not try and break the world record for that as well? Well, Jim phoned me up and he said, Jim Hickey, the director, he said, we're doing the film. You know, what do you want to do? Do you want to do anything? I said, well, I always wanted to be in the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, he said, well, yeah, but what are you going to do, though? I went, well, oh, because we did paintballs as one of the first things in the first series. I said, wonder if I can take as many paintballs to the human body and, and if there is such a thing. Jim goes, leave it with me. I'll do some research and I'll find out. If there is, let's do it. She came back to me and goes, not realising he most probably spoke to Daint and going, this is this is going to be a wicked wind-up, just tell him there is. So he told me, oh yeah, there is. Uh, we'll reveal it all on set. I was like, oh, brilliant, wicked. So we got to Russia, like minus 25, in this basement somewhere, dark, dingy basement. They hand me this paper, reading it, pop the Guinness Book of Records, printed and everything, really professional. And they said, and the current world record holder is Anthony Kelly from New South Wales, and he's got 102 paintballs. I was like, oh, I can beat that. And these, these paintballs, because it was so cold, the paintballs are getting solid. So I stood there and I was, yeah, I did 103. And my body was in a fucking mess. Literally, I've swollen arms, everything. Stoked. Phoned my parents, phoned, phoned my mates, phoned everyone. I'm going to get his book of records. Two weeks later, get, we were in Thailand. I did something. Well, I got I Love Dayton tattooed on my cock to wind him up. And uh, then he went, oh, I've got something to tell you. So what's that? He said, um, you know, that world record. <laughs> I, I made it all up. So there was no such thing. He'd actually wrote the papers himself and made it look professional. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you absolute, <laughs> you absolute bastard. But I'll give it to him. That was a that was, that was a yeah. Uh, and he goes, you've just got my name on your cock and I just fucking stitched you up mm. with, with paintballs. But I said, that's right, Dink. Every time I have a wank, I look at your name. And he's like, oh, you fucking bastard. <laughs> Did then MTV ever tell you that, no, that's too much? Uh, I... I think, um, was there anything he said too much? I think one or two things I think may have got, I know that my grip, the grip tape house, when I got, we put grip, sandpaper, sent, um, glued sandpaper to the floor and I put my ass in it and they got, they go, drag me across the whole thing, like a meter of grip tape. You have ripped, seen that? What was that one though? Ripped all the skin yeah, off my arm and then sold so, it, saw it again, yeah. blood everywhere. And I think when now, they did go out, it did get shown, you couldn't show that these days. Mm -hmm. And then they blanked the screen. You could hear the screams, but you couldn't see any. So and then, and then eventually it got banned. So um, yeah, that was yeah. How was the booze and stuff then? The drugs was that the height of it all? Or was that the just beginning? Uh, I mean, I've spoke quite a lot about this before in the past. So you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's nothing new to 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 anybody out there. I've been pretty open about it. It's just you know. Young, young dudes, you got a pocket full of cash. What are you going to do? You're going to, we're all bloody nut cases anyway, as you can tell. <laughs> filming, filming, the show, filming the show that we were doing. And we just, yeah, just, it was like a lucky dip, really, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's go for it. And we go for it. We went absolutely head first. Let's go. Bam. Did it make the, the pranks easier and the, well, the response easier? Or were you sober then doing them? Most of the day stuff we were sober, and most of the stuff you see in the house we call House of Doom, where we were the based. That so a lot of that is sort of drug, drink and drug fueled. 
not all of it, but most of it is like the nighttime stuff, and n n not much of that made it for obvious reasons because it looked like we were about to gurn our faces off and stuff. But that's not, that doesn't look good on camera. Uh, but yeah, I mean, most of the stuff we did sober, and we did when we did uh, live shows. We realised because we did so many live shows over the year. When we first started doing them, there were just car crashes. We didn't. There was no look, sort of planning into it we just got on stage and battered the living shit out of one another and we got off looking like we'd been in a multiple car crash but we realized then that you could never do cocaine before going on stage because everyone be talking over one another one person's more important than the next one and it just sounds like a clusterfuck so we sort of came up with this deal and the same with alcohol as well too much alcohol it was just a shit show so we sort of came up with this deal for two, we called it the two pint rule. So you'd have two pints before going on stage. So a bit professional as well then? Even yeah, so yeah, because yeah. I mean, at the end, of the, people are paying to come and see us. Of course. And they, you know, I know they want carnage, but they still want to see a polished show, even though they want carnage. And just seeing us arguing on stage wasn't, oh, I'll say that. It could be quite funny, an argument on stage with us mm -hmm. lot, but um, yeah. Just had to be. Yeah. How hard is that to be doing what you're doing on TV, on stage, and then seeing people on the street expecting you to be that character? But do you have to get into a character straight away or do you just like fucking leave me alone? You're tired. Like, how hard is that for people to see you and think yeah. you're going to be that way all the time? Yeah, when, you, when, you, when you're young and the show was at this peak and everyone was loving it and you, like literally you go, out, you go out into the street, into the clubs, in the, in the nighttime Friday Saturday, but absolutely bonkers. Like you put public enemy number one, and everyone wants to take photos with you, which is which is great because they all love the show. Uh, they all want to get pissed with you. All, the, the famous question, I don't know, about it, well, slap me in the face. I was like, well, I'm not going to slap you in the face. Well, you can fucking sue me or something. Oh, I'll smash this bottle on my head or or do something stupid. And it's like, oh, come on, I'm not a performing monkey. But then, depending how wrecked I was, you'd end up doing stupid stuff anyway. But it was. Didn't really mind it to start with, but then after quite a few years of it, it gets a bit tired. Mm. But at the same time, you'd never want to be horrible to people and you didn't want to tell them to fuck off because they're your fans, they pay your wages, and they, you know, you've got to look after them. Yeah. So you just sort of try and put them down nicely and say, oh, look, come on, just, just having a little day off for a bit. How did you end up in the advert with Wayne Rooney, a Nike advert? Three kids from Wales, one from England, to then being one of the greatest footballers of all time. Uh, Nike phoned up an agent, and I remember an agent from there going, right lads, I've uh, got a bit of a job for you. Which is, um, Nike's been on the phone, we were like, ooh, Nike, big brand. Mm -hmm. uh, they, want to, they want to do like a football thing with Rooney, Catuso, Torsten Frings, a few others and we were like oh ace this is brilliant yeah of course we're up for it yeah it's going to be the pay pack it was going to be decent it was Nike and getting to go and hang out with people like Rooney and stuff as well would have been amazing but Rooney was the first one and uh, <laughs> we were meant to be because we were going to film it at Rooney's house but then I don't blame him I don't think he wanted it to be at his house but let's go to a house which pretend is his it's a big huge manor with a big big field, grass. So Rooney was going to be on his mower or in his football field. And we were like, oh, Rooney, running towards him. And I just thought, poor, poor fucker. <laughs> he knows what we do. And he's, he's got us four running towards him going, Rooney, so he better not do anything to us. But man, he was, he was sound as fuck. He was really proper nice guy. Uh, we had a laugh with him. And I remember, I couldn't believe how hard he can kick a ball, how hard and fast. I was like, how would you do that? And anyway, we had the, we had the goals. I went, right, penalty, and I'm going to be the goalie. And he kicked the ball. And I, like this, honestly, I could, honestly, I swear to God, I dived like a proper dive and I saved a Rooney penalty. And it was just, oh, it was the best feeling ever. But that was so hard. I thought my hands were going to come off. Honestly, yeah. 
That's nice probably, yeah, I've, and I've yeah, yeah, claimed a thing. I've saved a Rooney penalty. <laughs> was that a good moment for you to then getting big brands like Nike coming from you, even though all the stuff that you've done? Because it's still a talent. It doesn't matter if people, even if you're winging it on live shows, it's still a talent to be creative for people to enjoy, for especially the human brain span. We don't, our concentration levels aren't the same. So for watching a show and creating something special where millions are watching, that takes talent. That's for, in my eyes. That's a talent. That's creativity to then be creating it. How much were you in control of the show and the final results, or was it all production telling you what to do? Um, it was a bit of both, really. Was it? Yeah, but yeah it was. Uh, I'd say NTV would come up with a few stunts and they'd have them all li listed down, uh, and then. There was a lot of spontaneous stuff as well, and then um, we found that the spontaneous stuff was the best. The, the, yeah, because it wasn't planned; it just came natural. And we always say, we always said, "Don't turn the cameras off; just keep the cameras on." Because even when we finished filming, something really funny could happen, like an argument might happen with Pancho, which would just be hilarious, or I'd argue <laughs> with Dane or whatever. But we always found that if you just kept the cameras rolling, gold, you'd always get gold because it, if you know what you're doing, it's planned. So it's not going to be as funny, but with us, just the spontaneity stuff mm -hmm. was 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 the best though. How did Pancho accept it with getting his hair shaved all the time, eyebrows, <laughs> and going off his <laughs> fucking nut? Like, was does he really sleep like that? Like where he he's out, he can't hear clippers, he can't hear shit. <laughs> right, Pancho. Right, he's I love Pancho the Betty. He's absolutely brilliant. Get on with them like house on fire. I hang out with him every now and again. Uh, lovely bloke. But when he when he's had a drink, especially when he was hanging out with the three of us and he knew what we were doing, mm -hmm. he was always on tender rocks and he'd have a drink. Well, he, well, he, he didn't stop drinking. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> he'd, he'd become a little bit of a nightmare. Not in a bad way. He's just like, oh, fantastic. So we were like, right. Sometimes he'd sort of look at you and he'd hit you across the face and go, ah, I was like, what, what the hell was that for? Ah, fucking nothing, fuck off. And it was like, me, Dane, Joyce, look at each other going, anyway, so that's why when he slept, we always messed around with him. Mm -hmm. But he would get so drunk that he was just, he was like, that's how out is he, but we, we, we got to know him so well. We thought, right, when he's, when he's gone to sleep, don't mess with him. Give him time to go into that deep sleep. And as soon as he's gone into that deep, we go, yep, he's deep in and we can do whatever. You can do whatever you want to. Mm -hmm. And then just leave him. And then when he wakes up, he realizes, just make sure you're about 10 meters away from him. See, <laughs> <laughs> see you can, I was you can start one, running. Not so long ago, actually, I was watching one there. He's just shaved the top of his head but left all the hair around at the side and, and put his, <laughs> hair back, his hat back on him. <laughs> that, was in, that was outside the house of doom. And he went, right, right, that one. Fuck a skate, on, fuck everything. Need food. Joyce, mm. you're fucking dead. <laughs> I've still got it in my head. Oh, brilliant. We've done some things to him. One of the good things he did is when we, we put, um, he fell asleep up in Scotland actually. And he, he fell asleep and he put, put one of the D locks around his neck, the bike D locks, heavy things. And Joyce said, boop, and swallowed the key. So Pancho woke up and went, take it off, get this fucking thing off me. <laughs> but he wouldn't, he obviously couldn't get it off. He said, where's the key? Jo Joyce, he swallowed it. Oh, great. So he had that on for three days, I think it was, whilst we were filming. And he, he went to the, he used to like go to the pub on his own for a point. So he'd go to the pub for a pint with the, with a D-lock around his neck and everyone was like, what the fuck you got that around your neck for? What oh, fucking boys put it on. And then Joycey then took a shit and he said, hey, the keys come out. And Pancho went, oh, brilliant. Get it out for me. And he went, no, you have to get it out if you want to get it off. So Pancho had to put his hand in his shit, get the key in, so get it off. <laughs> but then we did it again, it did it to him again with the same, with another D-lock, but this time we put saucepan lids and stuff on it as well. So when he woke up, he sounded like a one man band. Oh, it was mm -hmm. hilarious. Do you miss that? Obviously, when you talk about it, you see how happy you are. Like, how is well, it? It's just, how can you not like that? It's just yeah. like, like, me, me and Tate would be, oh, me, Tate, and Joyce would just be sitting there laughing because he's so fast asleep and we just knew what would happen when he woke up. That's a good age to be zero fucks given, isn't it? What, what, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, 
<laughs> That's brilliant. How much was the rivalry between yourselves and Jackass? Because Jackass was a, a global show as well. It was massive. Was there a rivalry between you and those guys? Or were you friends? Or did, these, did they know about you? Um, there was no rivalry. I mean, they did their thing. We did that. We they did their thing. We did our thing. Uh, I was Bam Bam a girl, skateboarder. I'd met him before. Sound. You know, never met John in Oxville. Met Steve O and stuff. And we went to America to do the Latin America Awards. They were there as well. Uh, yeah, it's all cool. I think the only beef we've had is I think Joycey went on the gumball once, and it, apparently Joycey wrecked his. Um, uh, because Joycey, rather than going on the private jet, he went on the plane with all the cars on it, the Russian plane, got pissed with the Russian pilot, and then drove Bam's Lambo off and burnt the clutch out. But that's the only... I don't think Joycey did, but I think somebody else did it. Anyway, Bam got pissed off, and he might think it was all of us, but I think something to do with Joycey. Who knows? It's all good anyway. But we never really had any rivalry. Um, I even... Because our show went out to MTV2 in America and did pretty well. Did really well, actually. And then the movie went out to America, the sense of the movie, and it was available on Blockbuster um, Blockbuster Video for hire. And we made four million quid or something like that. Uh, Harvey Weinstein bought into it, of all people. <laughs> yeah, so Harvey Weinstein, you still owe us four million quid. <laughs> Does it? Well, yeah, this is what we got told. But what we think he did, he bought Sanchez and didn't really put it out anywhere because he didn't want Jackass to get... He didn't want to ruin oh, the competition. So, yeah, so bought it to hide it. Yeah, bastard. Yeah, yeah. It just fucking goes with his nature then, dirty cunt. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So. That's just scary then, that just like, how far it can go and how far it went. But mm. that just shows how, the, how fucked up that industry is. Like any competition, any, even brands, whatever it is, people just buy it and, and sink it. Yeah, because people have got so much. But the thing is, because we're not, um, well, because it was now a brand, whoever sold it, happy days, they're laughing. Yeah, of course. I mean, he just, he sunk it over the other side. Mm. Mm. But that's just the way it is, isn't it? How hard was it when it was coming to an end for you? Did you already have things on the pipeline or was that a relief? Um, I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed the, uh, I really enjoyed filming. I mean, coming, for when, it was, when, it was, when it was coming to an end, if anything, it was gutting. Because, I mean, how can you not love doing that job? It's just, you know, you, you but at the same time, when it was coming to the end, things were getting a little bit more tense, because, you know, with all of the, the booze, the narcotics, the parties, everything, you know, you're hanging out in each other's pockets, so that kind of stuff, and you and you're touring as well. So all that kind of stuff is um, sort of getting quite heavy, and all the boys know that anyway. So if anything, we could we could we needed a nice big break from one another, and then started again. But it's yeah, it was it's a long story, and I'm a forgetful. <laughs> My head's been screwed over the years, but. Quite a lot of things happened. Dan and Dan and Panch went one way. Me and Dayton went another way. You know, me and Dayton started her also. Me and my date went back to Pritchard versus Dayton. So me and him were touring, just doing the Pritchard versus Dayton shows at nightclubs and stuff, which were quite successful. Successful. Uh, and we did that. I mean, they did uh, wrecked for MTV. Then we did Sanchez get high for MTV as well. And then Sanchez get high for me was most probably the, my favourite show I've ever filmed. And I'm gutted we didn't do Sanchez get high too because I just really enjoyed you know, travelling with Dink, learning uh, the other, the, how the other people live and tribes and stuff around the world and learning their medicines. Mm -hmm. and that was just a really good show. And me and Dink carried on that live show for. Well, up until 2014. Shit, so it wasn't, wasn't that mm -hmm. long ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I just, and I just could just see the crowds were dwindling. And at the same time, quite an old, getting old. And the last, I mean, who wants to see an old guy on stage sticking drumsticks up his ass? And it just came to that point where it just felt a little bit desperate. And it's just like, well, you know, we've had a good run. 
and I, that's when I decided in 2014 before I opened this shop actually I'd had some I had some money saved mm -hmm. and I needed to do something new I didn't have time before to open the shop because I was too busy touring Ed was in the shed a little bit uh, so I just wrote an email and um, said I'm out and just went from there then opened this shop and aid our tour manager he manages this place as well so um yeah, that's what happened from there, and that's when I sort of put, put the plug on it, really. Yeah, was that hard? Yeah, it was quite hard. It was because, well, I would say it was almost 15, well, 14 years of doing it with no stress whatsoever. It was just, was, when I say no stress, but you know what I'm saying, you just, you could do whatever you wanted. Mm -hmm. You were getting paid well. There was, you know, people loved what you were doing. It was just the 24 seven lifestyle, fun, games, traveling, partying, drink, just, it was just the dream. And then that sort of, when that dwindles, you sort of get a little bit, a little bit lost, but at the same time, you've got to look into the future and you've got to do something new, haven't you? Yeah, nothing lasts forever or else. Nothing lasts forever, no. That's, that's just life. That's the fucking circus, circle of life. So when you left, Dirty Sanchez and then done the Sanchez, Sanchez Get High, Getting High, which was an, another phenomenal show, especially back then, all the psychedelics and all that kind of natural medicines, they weren't really spoke about. How did that idea come about? The, I think MTV phoned us up and said, because we did Wrecked, we did one series of Wrecked, and then MTV phoned us and said, well, how would you like this idea? <laughs> You go around the world taking legal highs with tribes and all that kind of stuff. And, but you're not going to say, no, nah, I don't like that idea. <laughs> I was probably trying to do something else. Mm -hmm. But no, as soon as me and Dane here, that we're like, yep, sounds great. Let's do it. But then it was good because we sort of went back to that push out versus Dayton thing. And Dayton knows me inside out. I know him inside out. So he knows how to push my buttons. So that it, it was quite a, an educational show with a bit of comedy as well with me and him messing around with one another and it was just yeah it was it was a great show it was, it was filmed really well as well some of the countries we went to were great some of the tribes we met was, were amazing some of the drugs we did were we got medicine as they call them <laughs> were, 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 were good i mean we did mushrooms with in mexico never forget it the setting was just amazing it was in the mountains and there was no windows in this building and there was the flesh of the gods, I think they called it. And you could see the mushrooms in this tray, the shaman that was there with us. I think she's seen some of the Beatles as well through some of their mushroom trips many, many years ago. And um, me and him just sat there. We took these mushrooms and he just saw us through our trip and it was just so relaxed and peaceful and it started raining outside, you know, the pitter patter. It was, oh, it was ace. Did you eat a snake's heart as well? Yeah. What was that like? Fucking rank. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, man, mm. it was in Cambodia and they put the snake, I mean, obviously I wouldn't do that now. Vegan. Because you know, I'm vegan, yeah, but at the time I wasn't. And they put the snake through distress. So the adrenaline of the snake goes boom, straight into the heart. So you're sort of taking on adrenaline and then oh, the heart's still beating in your hand and you stick it in your mouth and you don't wash it down with water. You brought sweet it with snake's blood. I was in my mouth, I could feel it beating on my tongue, and I was just, I was gagging. I could, it took me ages to get it down. I got it down, though, in the end. What was the benefits from that? What's the benefits from that? Uh, I think it's the adrenaline. The adrenaline going into your body, into your, mm -hmm. into your veins, and just give, give me a whew, turning you into a man, I, I guess. Didn't do fuck all the <laughs> Apart from make me gag. <laughs> <laughs> How many places in the world did you travel for that show? Uh, we went to Cambodia, uh, the Philippines, Australia. We were going to go to Papua New Guinea, um, but we had a guy looking after us, a special forces guy, uh, and he was a medic as well. And he was like a security medic. And um, we were going to go to Papua New Guinea. And he said, well, if we're going to Papua New Guinea, I need, and he's Glaswegian as well. And he said, I need a gun. That's a shit Glasgow accent there. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I need a bloody gun, man. Yeah. And I was like, me and Dave just went, he needs a gun. I, 
saying, I don't want to go there. But anyway, we, because it was so dangerous, we didn't, he couldn't get a gun. We didn't end up going. So we, just, we did a few, I might, I want to be into the uh, Dominican Republic as well. Do some witch mastery kind of stuff. So there's a few places. Japan, that was ace because I paid for uh, some woman to shit on Dayton's head because the get high on sexual gratification and stuff. But that that was just, oh man, that was... <laughs> we were in a hotel room and we were going to have a prostate massage. Legal high, you know. And the setting was set. We were in a hotel room. Don't forget, you know yourself, behind the camera, the sound people, there's a the director, the producer, the this, this, that. And then we had to lay on the... He had a single bed there, a single bed there. We had to lay there. And they said, right, these ladies are going to come in now. So these ladies walked in, they had these cat's, cat's eye glasses on, and they just sit there, these little condoms they put in their fingers. <laughs> Me and Dave sat there, and they're, <laughs> they're lubing up their fingers, and they're, finger, they're massaging our prostates, and they're cracking us off at the same time. <laughs> and I'm just like, right. I'm gonna have to close my eyes here and pretend I'm somewhere else because this is like my mate's right next to me and there's loads of people around the camera like going, I guess. I just, let's just set out and go somewhere else. So I did. And I concentrated, concentrated because I wanted to come just for the shot at the camera and stuff. Anyway, <laughs> she's, she's cracking me off and fingering my prostate. <laughs> and all I heard to my left was, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> they did come, but as he said, I can as well. So I came at the same time as him. And I looked over and went, winked at him. He went, don't you dare. <laughs> don't you dare wink at me like that again. <laughs> After you've just shot your ball at the same time as me. I swear to God, man, it was the funniest thing ever. And, and ever, still to this day, I wind you up about it. And, uh, and I remember when it came out on TV, his mother said to him, goes, oh, I've seen what your cumflakes look, cumflakes <laughs> looks like. <laughs> like oh, fucking brilliant. But uh, yeah, and then I paid for him to get shot on. Was, yeah, mm -hmm. what a laugh. Some right. madness. <laughs> yeah. How does your, like, your mum, family members, when they watch that stuff, do they just see it as entertainment or do, they, do you tell them, right, don't watch this tonight? Uh, I mean, my, my parents watched it, they loved it. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I put, I put my mother through hell over the years. <laughs> but um, you know, when you tell her, well, what are you going to do today? Oh, just look, just don't tell me anymore. Mm -hmm. But she's, yeah, my parents are very supportive and stuff. They love it because they, they know themselves. I wasn't very academic at school. So if I'm going to make a living doing something I love and doing what I'm doing, then happy days. But um, yeah, it was... Uh, Sometimes she'd phone me up and say, well, I couldn't watch that. I almost, I was almost sick all over the place. So, pfft. I mean, still to this, when I did that, when I did going on the row and all that kind of stuff, when I do all these challenges, she's always, you know, she gets really worried then. So, I mean, I, I don't like seeing her worried, obviously, but you got to do what you got to do, haven't you? And yeah. she, knows, she knows I'm happy, so. I think that's a mother's instincts, just... No matter what you're doing, you keep in here cutting hair, doing tattoos, skateboarding, they're still going to worry. But for the career that you've had and the, the, the travel the world and making fucking films and series and working for MTV, it's phenomenal. It is a good feeling. No doubt your mum will be mega proud. There's not many people from Wales who says they've had a career that you've had. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like you left the blueprint for some of that mad shit twenty years ago that kids are doing now. I don't like the stuff you've done then. I, the TV would never touch that stuff now. TV shit now. Like nobody cares. Do you think? Like what do you think from watching the stuff on TV now to then back in the day when it was a kind of open to any idea? Yeah, I mean back in the day there was that. You know, there was there was us, there was Jackass, there was the Dudesons, and there was I think there was Team Squirrel for the Scottish guys, mm -hmm. and that was just it was, that was the scene then. But then, like you said, I think pff, you couldn't do half that stuff. I know I know Jackass are filming this their fourth film, but that's just going to be for cinema. But like you say, I mean, oh man, you can't 
you can't say anything these days <laughs> without being in trouble. So yeah. I dread to think if you really start with stuff with yeah. Sanchez, we don't be locked up. Without being a, a feminist, a sexist, a, oh, just, just a racist, a, you just, everybody's, they're just words getting through about too much now yeah. where people are getting silenced. You can't have a laugh. Like, even comedians, I know some are struggling like, because of some of the stuff. Like, I used to love like, Roy Chubby Brown, Eddie Murphy, like, people back in the day that were just a free for all. Like, I've I've got quite a sick nature and very dark. So when I see things, I'm like, oh, that's, that's not funny because people are just so PG now. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, it's a joke. Yeah. I mean, I've, I, I obviously, well, if you mean it, different story in it. Of course, if, yeah. it's all I do with meaning. Yeah. Yeah. But if somebody stands on the t- telling jokes, the stage telling jokes, it's their job. But people can still call me a taffy and a Welsh cunt and a fucking mm-hmm. sheep shagger, and I like, yeah. You laugh it off. Yeah, laugh it off. Mm-hmm. But then that's allowed them. I just, it's a strange world we live yeah, in. It's, it's crazy, man. Just, just live, laugh, love, and get on with it. Yeah. What happened? Were you in a supermarket and somebody stabbed you with keys? Um, wasn't keys. Was it a knife? But they said it was. They said it was, he got away with it as keys, but it was an actual knife. I remember that? Yeah. Just see it in my see my. Um, I was um, my girlfriend at the time. I just gone for. Um, I just went for a run. A six, maybe no, long I believe ran. A six mile run, and it was in Toftwood in Durham, uh, Norwich. And I ran back to her house, and she lived right next to a, a co op or whatever it was. And I thought, I'm going to go and get a drink. So I was thirsty, so I walked in, and there was a guy effing and blinding and screaming at the ladies behind the counter, and there was quite a few people in there as well, and women and children and stuff. and. Oh man, I was just lit. I thought the the actual some of the things you were saying. I just I just lost my I just lost my marbles. I thought you can't talk to people like that. It's just not on. So I just he came by the he came by the door and I just ran up to him and I just grabbed grabbed him by the grabbed him by the throat and just chucked him out the door. I said, Don't you dare speak to people like that again. I, well, I'm not <laughs> I'm not an odd guy. At all, I can't stand fighting. I hate confrontation. But that guy, yeah, the what he was doing was doing anything. So I just chucked him out, and then he came barging back. He pushed the door back in. I turned around, and he had one of those, it was like an oval plastic thing with a thing you push out, and there's a blade. And he just went, just sliced down there on my chest, and then I didn't feel it. And I turned around, I saw my girlfriend at the time, she went, ah, just a screaming, crying, fell to the floor. And I was like, what? And then it was blood everywhere. And I thought, oh, shit. And uh, that was, oh, yeah, that was, oh, that was, that was pretty heavy at the time because, you know, you just think you're going to, any minute now, I'm going to go to sleep. And uh, the women in the shop calls an ambulance. And one of them came up and they gave me a, um, a, a tea towel to try and I, did I wrap it around my neck and tie, tie it on and strangle myself. Uh, it was just put on that anyway to stop the bleeding. And I think it, it literally just missed my juggler. Isn't the juggler? It's yeah. so close to it. Mm-hmm. So he's put it on there. And then I just sat down. They should give me a seat. And I sat down. And I just was just, honestly, I was just waiting to go to sleep. I thought any minute, I'm just gone, I'm a goner. And then I was there for quite a while until the ambulance came. I thought, well, if I've been here all this time, it should be all right. Anyway, the ambulance came. I got in the ambulance and then they took me to the hospital in Norwich. And when you're in that situation, you look at other people's faces. I was really calm. I was quite surprised how calm I was, considering I thought I was going to die. But... I kept looking at other people's faces and you can tell by the look of their face how bad it is because people do that or... And when I got to the hospital, they took it off. I saw some, some of the doctors and nurses give a bit of one of those looks. I thought, oh, that's really bad. Anyway, I was fine. I was good, obviously, because I'm still here. They did a load of internal stitches, uh, external stitches. Just somebody there on my chest. And... Uh, then I went and just relaxed in my, my girlfriend's house at the time and then went to court and the guy got five years. And you could have been dead? Oh, I could. 
Well, easily I mean, it's your neck. All the stuff that you've been through, all the stunts, all the madness with Dirty Sanchez and try to help women in a supermarket before you know you could have been fucking dead. What year was this? Um, good question. 2006, 2007, something like that. So no, it's about 2008. So at the height of your career, at the height of Dirty Sanchez and all the fame, attention. Yeah, but just, it wasn't the height height, but it was yeah, still pretty, still well, yeah, still pretty you know, well known, uh-huh. sure, yeah. But, yeah, and that's taught me lessons. Don't, I mean, it's sad, really, you should be able to get involved in stuff mm-hmm. like that, because, but um, it also taught me to be careful and watch. Yeah, that nobody's on. Think yeah. before you do something. Mm-hmm. How does that make you reassess your life? At the time, I was like, you know, stuff like that happened. I'm thinking, well, I could, I shouldn't be here. I should be dead. Because if he, if he hit that wrong nerve, I would have, I would have been gone. So I, at the time, I thought, yeah, I'm just feel extremely lucky to still be, be here and be able to do what I'm doing. Uh, I don't know if it, I wouldn't know if it's really affected me mentally or over the years. Maybe <laughs> well, I was mental to start with. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I would have to I'd have to speak to professionals or something, but if yeah, if, it, if it has done something to me mentally and so Yeah, no doubt it would have like nearly dead like I mean, when I'm when I've when now you've brought it up and mentioned it, I I have gone a bit Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not only just leaving your loved one at a time, it's your mother and everyone else in your life that you come through your mind. Did you have any flashes or did anything but did you think fuck like did you see a light or was it no we because just... I, I didn't see a light because i wasn't i wasn't on my way out mm-hmm. i mean in my head i thought it was because i knew it was on my neck and my missus screaming on the floor and that only says to me there's a really bad cut and everyone else coming over to me and putting anything going uh, but um no i just remember being really peaceful i remember being so, so calm. calm it was weird like I should have been like, you would have thought you'd be panicking, wouldn't yeah. you? I thought fucking gonna die, but I was just like, shh, just sat there. Just concentrate, <laughs> concentrate and think of the light should have bugged it well, but they didn't, yeah. so. Probably saved your life though, being calm. You could yeah. have bled to death, or you, being calm's probably saved your life. Could could have, yeah. Yeah. I mean, who knows, but um, yeah, fair play to the ambulances and the doctors and stuff, they didn't have to do a good yeah. job. They don't get the credit that they deserve. These no, people that no, are saving no. lives every day no. and the recognition they deserve. My mum's a home help and even the work that she does for Cordier and just t- seeing old people every day and helping them, like, they do some amazing work. Like people just help them. These are the ones who should be getting paid football yeah. salaries. They're, they're the ones who should be called heroes. Yeah. Uh, do, do you know what I mean? There's so many people call heroes these days and it's like, yeah. anyway. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I know there's a guy in... in uh, What's his name? The comedian Rob, Welsh comedian Rob. Ah, mm-hmm. uh, he did a, he did a thing on uh, jobs. Oh, it's bugging me. <laughs> oh damn, that's going to do my head in. He, he did a he did a show anyway. He did he does jobs. He, he was, so uh, Rob whatever goes mm-hmm. and does this this week, and he worked in a care home. And uh, and doing the job of a care on worker, and it was just it was really good. Just just shows you how hard their job is. Yeah. And they just don't, you know, they get no any of the credit or the wages for it as well. Definitely, man. It's mm-hmm. like these you should be getting paid through the ass for those kind of stuff. Exactly. So going through all that, then the career when you kind of you never retired, but 2014 you made some changes. What was life like after 2014 when you quit doing the live shows? Well, I start. I in two thousand and nine. I think it was two thousand and ten. I started looking at do, taking doing a bit of fitness mm-hmm. because with for, with years of going going bonkers, so it took its toll a bit. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, set myself a goal. So I did the Cardiff Half Marathon when I was fifteen. Wonder if I could do it again. So I set that goal and I ran the Cardiff Half. Loved it and started found just, just sort of found another addiction really um fitness running and i was sort of burning candle the burning the candle at both ends like if i 
Yeah. Working out, I can do all this training. <coughs> I've done all the training and go out now. Gives you a free pass. Yeah, but I give a free pass. <coughs> uh, and then that's when I then I did a full marathon. And then I was looking at doing the Ironman. I did Ironman Bolton in 2011. Uh, and I just worked my way up with all them kind of things. But 2014. Do you think the near death experience made you? do the fitness kind of side of things to keep fat healthy on your toes it, it, it might have uh, without me knowing but um, mm-hmm. I know when I took one look at myself be unhappy when, when I was in when I was in Sanchez I was bloated and yellow and it was just like oh man what have I become I don't get me wrong I had a lot of fun doing it but I didn't want to be that fit and unhealthy and chubby and fat mm-hmm. and stuff. The, the, everything that it, that party and lifestyle does to you. I Having just fun, to do d- destroying yourself at the same yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. And mm-hmm. I just wanted to do something about it. So I did. Um, you know, in 2014, when I started working at opening this place, I had another, something else to focus on. And it's still here today, six, six seven years later. And I've sort of... Yeah, the party's been turned right down. And I just love doing I just love doing fitness stuff, going up mountains, doing adventure stuff, just hanging out with my dog, hanging out with my fiance and just doing the simple life stuff. Yeah. I'm the same, like I've replaced like six other addictions for another six, but it's more healthy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't, sometimes is it healthy that like, I want to be the biggest podcast on the planet, I want to be the biggest presenter, I want to run ultra marathons and but I still question myself. I still think what the fuck is it all about like really like see when you started changing it all did you feel happier or were you escaping from more stuff uh, I think like you said I think you changed well, I, what, I literally what I did I changed one addiction for another addiction that's all it was but the new addiction was far healthier than the last addiction but then is the new addiction far healthier because I was pushing myself so fucking hard with running, cycling, swimming, that it couldn't have been good for my body because I was just doing ridiculous distances. And until I got a coach, Mark Whittle, and he sort of gave me a plan, and I realized I didn't have to swim until I almost drowned just to, <laughs> to train for an event. But that, and that worked really well. But still, you know, I, I did one Ironman. I wasn't fucking happy with that. I wanted to do a double Ironman, so I did a double. Well, I've done double. I want to do a triple. And then two years ago, I did 10, 10 full eye events and 10 days. Oh, no, no, actually, in 2015, I did 30 half eye events in 30 days. And then I thought, right, I want to do the ultimate, and that's the, the 10, the 10 full eye events in 10 days, which is, I did the continuous version. There's two, two versions. There's one a day for 10 days, and there's the continuous. And the continuous is a 24 mile swim in a swimming pool, a 25 meter swimming pool, which is 1,500 something length. Uh, and then get out and you jump on your bike and that's a 1,120 mile bike ride in a seven mile loop. And you keep going over the time in mat and you just keep going. So I was doing 21 hours a day on the bike, three hours sleep back on the next day, keep going. And then once you've done that, then it was the 262 mile run in a one mile circle around the lake. So just going around 260 times and then cross the finish line, done. How do you feel after that? Fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a sense of accomplishment, it, a completion of something mentally, physically? When, again, do you, when again, can like you enjoy you said, that? Do you, is there a moment you enjoy that? Like maybe two or three days later, because I imagine you've all cuts and sores and blisters. Oh, I was, I honest, I was at complete, my body was completely utterly ruined but when I was I switch, I just enjoyed it because I switched myself off I I find the world and life too noisy and just like in my head just wants to go ah and like just a, any kind of excuse like that to escape and do something like that when I'm on when I'm running when I'm cycling when I'm swimming it's almost like a meditation thing for me I'm away from everything so I switch off so when I was there doing the Decker it was just all in the same place you shared in uh, the race, what well, race if you can call it, with like-minded people, and you just go around in circles. My phone was switched off. 
my emails were switched off and it was just me in my own mind just going around the circles cycling yeah I was in pain but at the same time my endorphins were kicking off and it was just yeah, it's ace, man. It was just me and, yeah. own, me and my own world. Is that but when again, I don't know why. Yeah, is that when you feel free, though? Because it's like switching off from, it's like disconnecting from the universe. That like even the podcast, the documentary scenes, the views give me attention, give me likes. That's not what fulfills me. It fulfills me for 10, 20 seconds when I'm feeling low and I post a photo from two weeks ago for people to give me some attention that I'm not really happy, but I want attention. But when you're on running or you're pushing yourself to new limits, new heights, the body can go through so much. It's the brain. We're built for comfort. So if you're pushing yourself to pure extreme, feeling free, feeling alive, where you feel as if you're living, taking chances, taking risks. It's, it, 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 I said that on the boat when I was rowing. I said, uh, I, I remember saying it to the skipper. I looked at my phone when I was out at sea, and it, you know when it says screen time? When I'm, at, when I'm on land, my screen time... Oh, I'm 10, 11 hours here. Yeah, 12 hours, 12, yeah, 12 and a half. Here, I'm yeah. like, Look, that's disgusting. And mm. then on the boat, it just came up as 37 minutes. I went, it's 37 minutes for a reason, because I'm fucking living. Yeah. And that's exactly what it was. I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything on my phone. I'm mm -hmm. rowing, two hours a day, two hours on, every single fucking day for seven weeks. And that's... Well, that's living, isn't it? That's living. Because look at human beings now. The lockdown's finished, but people are too scared to come out of the house. They've conditioned themselves into it's pure fear. Yeah, fear of anxiety that they don't want to do anything. That's a scary part. What does the training take to do 10 Ironmans in 10 days? I think, again, I did it with... Uh, no, I didn't, no, I didn't. I didn't train nowhere near as well as I should have. I know that. Uh, but I... You know, I've done with with experience. I I sort of like the like, experience. I think would help me get through it. And I know I'm pretty mentally strong enough to do it. I'm, but still, I was going into the unknown. I've never done that many uh, that, that much distance before. So I trained what I could, and then and I think you can only train to a certain amount anyway. Because as soon as you get to a certain peak, the only thing that's going to get you. Past the past the finish line is is that mental. Your, men, is yeah. your mental toughness, and uh, I did the swim wasn't too bad. When I got on the bike, that's that was that was the testing thing. The bike was just oh, on your ass and stuff. My all my undercarriage, all the skin had gone, been taken off, so it was just red raw. So I have to keep looking after that, making sure it didn't get infected. Because if it got infected, I would have been game over. And I couldn't sit down on my bike seat for a good 45 minutes every time I got back on it because it was so sore. So it's just, I think it's just that I'm too stubborn to, to give, quit. Up, give up, to quit. I ain't going to fucking quit. And my leg would have to fall off for me to quit. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm in pain. Yes, I'm, but yes, I was moaning quite a, quite a lot. But it is what it is, and there's no way I, I wanted to cross that line, and I wanted to get that buzz across mm -hmm. the line and say, I've done 10, 10 full iron in 10 days. Fair and play, I, and man. I crossed the line, and whew, I had the, the, the Welsh flag around me, and some tears in my eyes. My brother's on the line, give him mm -hmm. a hug, and yeah, it was great. Have you ever been depressed, suicidal? Uh, yeah, I've, yeah, been there. <laughs> yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've talked about it before, I talked about it on. Um, did a, I don't really want to go there again. That's okay, man. Well, of course, man. I mean, I, I've, I, I spoke about it with. Uh, I did a show called uh, Wild Man to Iron Man for BBC, and I opened up about it then. Yeah. I don't really want to go there again. Yeah, of course, because I'm just talking from experience as well. Like I'm doing, we're doing the 100K. I got a calf injury, but the majority of people are doing these extreme runs and pushing themselves to the extremes. Like I've battled addictions back in the day, had those mental thoughts and mental battles. And I've replaced it with something else, but it's still, it's like people who's been close to the, close to death, close to the suffering and they've bottled it up and then they'll maybe try and heal the suffering through alcohol, drugs, whatever it is, but then doing it for a natural phase, which is, I believe anybody that's fucking struggling, anybody that's watching this or really battling, is to get out in the nature, even walking, even if you don't, I, I don't like running. I don't fucking like it. I don't like it, but yeah, I'll go and smash a 50k run and I'm thinking, but it's, see for that three, four hours after a long distance run, I feel untouchable. The, 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 it does disappear and I'm not a doctor, but 
for people that really are battling nature where it's at exercise is key like just keep believing that you can make changes and that's important for anybody that is struggling well yeah 100% I totally agree with you. I think nature a massive plays mm. a massive part. Like you said, with running, running is the most e- the easiest thing you can do. It's to put your trainers on, go out the door. And I've al- I've always said this: it doesn't have to be twenty miles, it doesn't have to be ten miles, it doesn't have to be five miles. Even if it's a mile, and you're guaranteed if you felt like shit, that the hardest way, the hardest thing to do is get yourself off that sofa. If you can get off your sofa, put your shoes on, run out the door, run a mile or whatever you're comfortable with. Come back in the house. I guarantee you, you will be a different person to what you were before you left. Every single time. You, nobody ever regrets a workout. And today with so many people, I mean, you know, I've, I've been there, I've had, uh, going to the doctor with depression, I've had sertraline tablets, this, that, that, I'm just trying to sort my head out. The only thing that sorts my head out is exercise. Now doctors, instead of doctors prescribing pills and pills and pills and pills to people, they should be prescribing gym memberships and giving them workouts to do and stuff. And you, you watch your life change as soon as you start doing exercise and, and getting out in nature rather than sitting down, eating shit food, watching the TV, watching the shit they put on that TV constantly. It, it, that's not good for anybody. Yeah. And everyone's just been locked down. We've all been locked down. And we've been stuck in front of that TV. And especially with the news, and the news at the moment is not good for anyone. Yeah, switch your news off, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Christ. And if people are arguing about this, it's just, oh, I mean, you, you are allowed out to exercise as well in lockdown. Mm-hmm. So make use of that time, get out. And it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's not easy for everybody. I understand that because a lot of people haven't got gardens, a lot of people locked up in little flats and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. you can, for anyone out there, if you want to, you want to sort yourself out, go for a run. Definitely, yeah. So, the row, how did the row come about? Rowing around the Atlantic, what was yeah. it 3,700 miles? No, 3,200 miles. Yeah, for 377 is better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, how did that come about? Was that just another way to test yourself and push yourself to pure well, extreme? My mate John Askell, he's a, he's a fireman. I was doing stuff with him in 2011. He was doing uh, raising money for the firefighters charity and Tesco's on the treadmill in full fire outfit, uh, breathing apparatus. So we take it in turns and stuff. And he was going to do the Atlantic from uh, Lagomera to uh, Antigua. Uh, he did it amazing, watched his journey, followed his journey. And then in lockdown, I went for a bike ride and he, he lives on a boat now in Cardiff Marina. And I could see him outside, he went, hey, John, John, what's happening? He said, I'll come down. So I came down to his boat, spent some time out in the bay, having beers and stuff and having a chat. And then a few days later, he phoned me up and he said, oh, do you want to roll the Atlantic? And I got asked a few years ago and I just said no, because in my head, it was just, for me, it was death. It just spelled death for me. Why? For this, for this time, why? Yeah. I don't know, because I just see that that's a big bad sea out there. All mm-hmm. it takes is one big wave and you're a goner. And yeah. Anyway, he asked me, and I didn't even think about it. I just said yes, because it was locked down and I couldn't think of any way better to be than away from my house on a boat with nature rowing. So he said, right, cool, I'll... Um, I'll speak to the Monkey Fist Adventures guys, Billy, Barry, um, and um, Alex. And I gave him a ring to find out what, what does it entail and all this kind of stuff. And, and then Barry came down to speak to my parents uh, to tell them what, what's, you know, what it's going to be like. And my mother started worrying. And I, I actually, I, I checked before I said, well, I said yes, but to confirm my yes, I had to check with... Uh, Aid, my business business partner in year, Miles, head barber, mum, uh, fiance, obviously. Uh, they all just give me permission. And then you come down to my mother with entailed. And it just, it just went from them. So like, well, yeah, cool. We're going in end of January from Lanzarote. And uh, start training, start eating, putting on weight because you're going to lose a bit. So I managed to get, because it was locked down, I managed to get a row machine from a mate's gym put in my front room in the house. Uh, Mark Whittle, my coach, he gave me a training plan 
And then I just started rowing in that. I was rowing on a Concept 2 row machine. The fucking worst thing ever, man. <laughs> just in the house. Uh, uh, nothing, but yeah, anyway. Did that. And we chose the other people who were going to be joining us. There was um, Johnny, the guy who's travelled to all the countries in the world. And then there was... Martin, who has been in the oil industry for, for many years, he's a 62 year old. And then it was Billy, so there's four of us. Billy was my partner on the boat, and Johnny and Martin were rowing partners on the boat as well. Uh, but there were so many obstacles. Women, it would go on or not because of Brexit, COVID, uh, borders being closed. And uh, we, they, they did a lot of research into how we can get there legally. And apparently, if you're doing such big charity events, that you're allowed to, you're allowed to get into Lanzarote. So everything was above board. So we didn't do anything illegally, and we got there. And we spent some. I spent some time with Johnny and Martin. And got to know him quite a bit before we went. And then Billy was coming with a boat from uh, Avon Marina Boatyard, uh, and that took eight to ten days. Yeah, and the boat turned up. Loads of stuff was going wrong constantly. Like the boat got there, then we couldn't get the boat out because we didn't have the right paperwork. We were like, fuck, we need to go, man, because the hurricane season's in May in, in Antigua and we don't even... Anyway, we launched from Lanzarote, can't remember, it was just the first week of March and started rowing out to Antigua. And it was, I, it was most probably the most emotional thing I have ever done. I can't begin to tell you how many times I cried on that, but not on the boat before leaving. Like, I, cause there's a documentary uh, going to be made about it. So we were filming for it. And um, I had to FaceTime my my fiance before leaving. And uh, just trying to trying to say goodbye to my fiance. It was just, I was just in tears, man. I couldn't speak. Because I was just, to me, I was going out with the big bad sea. To which die? Is, which, which is, you know, it's a vicious. Yeah. It's a gnarly yeah. place, though. And, and I had to phone my mum and dad. I was crying doing that. <sighs> it's just got on the boat and then off we went. And then we got next next to... And it was two days in. And the... Billy said, stop rowing. Because the, 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 the seat that I was on, the rollers, the, the thing started snapping. So we had to put the para anchor in, which is a big parachute which goes in the water on a hundred foot line, which then stops us from getting blown further. We called for the SOS, the Spanish SOS. They came to rescue us. And all they did was argue between one another. And then we were like, whoa, man, we've got to get this power anchor in. It's just trying to pull the power anchor a hundred foot of line. And they're like, oh, and then the next thing, whoosh, crashed into us, rough seas as well bust all the fiberglass on the boat and I'm just sitting there going, oh my God, we haven't got anywhere yet, we're going to fucking sink. We, they hooked us up, took us seven hours to pull us back to Fort Ventura. We packed the boat up there. It took five days to fix it and then we hit the seas again and then it was two hours on, two hours off, 24-7 for seven weeks until we got to Antigua. Was there any moments at Fort Aventura? Was it Fort Aventura yeah. that fucked us? I'm just going to get a flight home. Uh, there was a good opportunity for people to do that. Yeah. Smoke bomb. But, uh, I was like, nah, nah. I, I, I mean, no, I, as much as that was quite scary, I thought, nah. I just wanted to get going on that boat. Really wanted to get going because before going out, my head was all over the shop. I was. Just, losing the plot and then like i knew that as soon as i got on this boat i'd get to the other side with a massive smile on my face and i was looking forward to it but just being the first two weeks was amazing i was just like yeah man you're gonna wake up and you see the sunrise every morning you see the sunset moonrise moonset i've never seen that before and i was just like wow and when there was big when there was no full moon and it was dark you just turn the lights off on the boat and the the stars and the Milky, you could see the Milky Way. It was just like nature cinema. And it was mm -hmm. just like, whoa. And it was just, and you row for two hours, you go into your little cabin, you cook your food. They'll take jet boil water, put it in the bag, dehydrate your food, sip it up, 50 minutes and you eat it. So you get about an hour's sleep, wake back up again, two hours, repeat, repeat. And then when we got to, it was one day we had really bad weather. 
fucking huge, huge spells. And I was like, what? And I said to Billy, because Billy's done the, the Indian Ocean, he's done three other oceans. I said, is, it, is this big weather? He said, yeah, this is pretty big. I was like, right, game on. And fucking right at the top of these waves, could see everything. And next minute you're down the bottom and you look up and it's just this wall of water. It's like, fuck. It's a, it's a proper roller coaster. And then there was one day which was no, literally the, the smoothest sea. It was just glass and there was no noise at all. It was so peaceful. And the boys were sleeping. So we woke them up just so they could come out and witness it. And the four of us just sat on the deck, just looking. It was just, yeah, had a bit of a moment. It was nice. Yeah, that's good to have a moment, a natural moment. Yeah. But it's after run sometimes, I feel very emotional. I lie in the bath and I think, poof. I feel fucking like I feel well, like I've yeah, I feel as if I've accomplished something that like I think oof because I'm an emotional guy anyway. Like I cry at majority of things that like obviously when I'm alone, I don't know what the fuck it is, just a build it or whatever. But after I run, I think I lie in my bath and I think oof, I've achieved something here because I know how much I can slip. Like over the last four weeks, I've done my calf, I can't run, and I've just blown battered the weight on again. I should still be going to the gym. I could still be going cycling, whatever. But that's just my. F- get out of jail free card. Do, did you uh, sometimes have tears when you're running as well? Yeah, because my, yeah, the yeah, music yeah, I yeah. listen to the is music. sad as fuck. <laughs> 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 so I've got a whole mixture of music yeah. I listen to. Sometimes an audio book or motivational stuff or dance music. But I've got a mixture of sad music that I know it makes me sad. Reason being is because, I don't know if anybody else does this, but sad songs make me realise that I'm still alive. So they make me go, why, why should I quit? Don't quit because people are dead that would still love to be out mm-hmm. here so that reminds me it's quite a dark thing but it still reminds me that I'm here so keep pushing yourself James like there's limits and there's there's so many stairs to the ladder that I want to go in life so it's fucking weird that I do do that yeah, that's, what, yeah that's, that why, that's, why, that's why I asked you because yeah. I can get if I get run as high Mm-hmm. I do it doesn't happen very often yeah and you know runners are just yeah, yeah, the yeah. best thing you just mm-hmm. feel like Superman fucking mm-hmm. Batman all in one like I can fucking do anything yeah and there's music playing mm-hmm. you're high as a kite yeah natural naturally mm-hmm. high as a kite and sometimes you just start crying it's just yeah but that's and I say to my missus I come back and I'm like oh that was so, that was amazing man I said oh, it brought me to tears mm-hmm. what do you mean tears <laughs> was, it, was it painful was it yeah. no 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 mm-hmm. I just fucking I was just so, so happy I was just yeah. like yeah yeah, yes. that's a great feeling, but that only comes, like I've done that once, I think, when I've done a 35k for the second time, it brought me to tears just after it. I just felt like laying down in the grass and I was in, I was in pain to a certain degree, but it was a happy pain because I'd accomplished something again. Uh, like I shouldn't be running the, the runs that I'm doing at 14, 14 and a half stone. But I still get out and smash him, comes up here, man. I'm fucking, I'm deluded. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm <laughs> fucked up. Like, I shouldn't be running those weights. Like the boys are under for 12 stone, 13 stone, great shape. I'm 14 and a half stone and I'm I'm pushing it. They will kick on after, there's a, there's a stage that I get to 22 miles. I wobble, <laughs> I wobble mm. every fucking time. Like something comes in, just quit. And yeah. I wobble and then I push through and then I kind of, I, I feel fucking great again. But I do wobble. Yeah. Many times when I'm running high distance, I want to get this 100k. I will smash it before September. My calf's starting to feel good. The weight will come down again. But I want to maintain it. I don't maintain. I get myself in great shape and then I go fucking missing. Yoga. Yeah, I've been doing hot yoga, but obviously yeah. with the, the no, lockdowns being get, closed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you get the stretching and everything is really yeah. good. I know we all say it, but we don't always do it do we no you it's it hard the, the, the stretching's harder than the fucking <laughs> <The> run <running. laughs> yeah. yeah but you know sometimes if like if you do like a massive run or mm-hmm. whatever it may be and you next morning you feel fucked yeah three and days you wake four up days and you're like oh i can't yeah. walk it. but i'm happy as a pig and shit you yeah. know I'm like yeah i did something man mm-hmm like a positive thing yeah you're like not waking when you up, wake up and you've had a shitload of fucking yeah, bills yeah, yeah. and this and that and you're like Ugh, mm-hmm. that's negative but when you've done like a big marathon and you can't walk down the stairs it's like yes yeah yeah <laughs> how did it feel then crossing that was there a finishing line was there family and friends there what was the moment when you crossed the line after the row that was i think that was one of the the worst things about the road you know because because of covid not having yeah. Oh fuck yeah! Because yeah. that was uh, to me. That's that's like, the moment you fucking you you do yeah, it for. I, I, that's to me that would to see your family, you know, your close mm-hmm. family of your loved ones after going through all that. 
you know, I, I would, I, I, well, I just know I would have just broken down into tears seeing them. And yeah. I knew they weren't going to be there. And I still quite emotional, even though they weren't going to be there. Mm -hmm. I remember Billy, um, I remember I woke up in the morning and Billy said to the skipper, who, who was an absolute fucking diamond, by the way, uh, he said, uh, have a look behind you. I literally turned around and there it was, a cliff. A cliff, with, I could see it all with my eyes. It wasn't miles away, it was just there. I was like, fuck, we've fucking done it. And I just had, I didn't say to him, I just had this little moment to myself. I, was fucking, I had some tears in my eyes and stuff. And thought, well, you know, you just look, if you look back, and you just uh, you think, fuck, seven, mm -hmm. seven weeks out to sea and you, 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 you know, you've, you've done it. I never thought I'd ever do that in my life. And then you, yeah, you just see that. That's amazing. Congratulations. Proud yeah, of you, no, brother. Cheer, cheer, yeah, man. I'm proud of you, man. I genuinely yeah. was rooting for you. I was sending clips to like my sister and that. I was like, I like how well he's doing because I know you get photos, but days you would look fucked. You're like lying oh, in a yeah. bed and I go, <laughs> and the weight was falling off you day by day. But I, I was genuinely following your journey because I think if you can do that, I get jealous. You could do it. Yeah, that's what you've I, got, you've got I, yeah, for it. Yeah, but I, 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 I think, yeah. like, I get jealous, even though you root for people and you want them to do well. I think, if he can fuck, why can't I do that? I get annoyed. Mm. That's the way my mind works. If I see somebody running 300 miles, I think, I, I go, that's amazing, but I think I can fucking do that. I'll show him. But then I think that's, you know, for, for, for me to do it, because everyone knows I'm an ex record, mm -hmm. and if I can show them I can do it, then to them, yeah, hopefully that will inspire them to think well if he can do it so can I do it yeah. and I think uh, I mean it's the same with you I mm -hmm. guess you know if you can do these big feats of physical endurance well, anyone can do it yeah. anyone can do it if you've just got to want to do it Where do you if go you don't from, want to yeah. do it you know where do you go from here with it now how do you raise that bar uh, I asked I asked Billy the skip, I said, well, Indian Ocean? Because I know he's doing the Indian Ocean next year from, it's going to be the first people to go from Australia to um, Basel or something like that. Uh, Indian Ocean's another different kettle of fish, really tough apparently. Pacific Ocean. Um, I don't know, man. I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I, whether I, I, I'll do another ocean because I really enjoy it. So if I get the chance to do another ocean, I think I'll be up for doing it. I don't think my mum and my uh, fiance will be though. But um, uh, after doing something so physical, I knew from experience that when I got home, I'd have to concentrate on doing something, setting my mind f for another challenge. Because uh, there's, I think there's, they, there's a thing called the rowers low. I'm guessing any any ultra endurance thing, and I have had it before. Just go whoop, just start eating like shit and just doing nothing. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to find something new another challenge to do and then I found out this is this backyard ultra thing in North Wales uh, August the 27th and it's run four miles 4.1 miles every hour you have to complete four miles mm -hmm. in, in, within the hour until you can't run anymore and then the, the word person who wins is the last man standing so I mean, I'm not, I'm not going there to win that. I mean, I'd be happy if I can get the 100. I've always wanted to do the 100 yeah. miles mm -hmm. in one, one go. And I think that the event happened last weekend. Mm. There was two guys, Matt and John, and they did refuse to give up. And the record was 75, that's, that's 75 hours. Mm. And they kept going around. They beat the world record and they just kept going. And mm. they got to around 80 and Matt chucked the towel in. John had to finish another lap to call himself a winner. So he mm -hmm. was, he'd been running for 80 hours with no sleep and did 357 miles. For fuck's sake, man. Just uh, shows you what can be done, though. It, well, exactly. It just shows. Would you just go out and try and do the 100 straight away without taking a break? Because if I, if I run and stop, I'm fucked. I, st I can't really go again. Everything seems to seize up with me. Yes, same year. So I would need to go full steam ahead. <laughs> and just try and get it done as fast as I could. Daily Thompson, it right around right, 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 right. Do you know what I mean? But I, I believe, well, you have to, I mean, if I was running my normal pace when I'm fit, I could do four miles in half an hour. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, I'd be looking at about 45 minutes. So I'd use that 15 minutes to take on some food. 
yeah some maintenance and stuff and then mm. off again so because i know people are all over the 48 hour one but that's four miles every four hours of four hours every four hours that people are doing and people are struggling with that because you still need to get up at like 2 a.m it's 6 a.m it's not, not easy. easy man to well, do I, that and with any enjoyed anything from 1 a.m to 5 mm -hmm. that's the hard how's your sleeping to... pattern just now how are you getting up in the mornings are you feeling lighter are you getting up earlier uh yeah pretty good yeah i mean my missus is old from dublin mm -hmm. so um i was actually gonna wake up at 5 a.m this morning and go for a run start training for that um for the ultra but mm -hmm. i didn't do it this morning i got pissed off at myself <laughs> <laughs> you know scored out yeah. i meant to do it now so oh, you but I'll, I'll i'll get a run in later mm -hmm. or i'll start tomorrow and then Wednesday, I'm just joining Sean Conway on some run. He's doing Brecon Beacons, he's mm -hmm. doing 15, 15 marathons in all the national parks across the country. So I'm going to join a run with him on Wednesday. Sleeping at the moment takes. Easy peasy. Easy. Yeah, sometimes I go through stages I can't <laughs> sleep because my mind's constantly ticking. And uh, yeah, that is what it is, isn't it? But I'm the same. That, that's why we've got to keep pushing myself. That's why I'm constantly traveling as well, just to keep. Keep busy. Keep us feeling as if I'm achieving something and working hard. What about the vegan stuff? Would you celebrity chef, dirty vegan? Yeah. How did that change your life as well? Um, well, I was looking, I was doing a lot, obviously I was doing a lot of the ultra enjoying stuff and doing a lot of research and a lot of the ultra ultra runners, uh, cyclists, you know, a lot of them are on vegan diets and I wondered why. So I started looking into it and then there was uh, somebody said, oh, what's cowspiracy? And to me, veganism was, you know, not eating meat or dairy. Uh, and that was it. And then I watched cowspiracy and didn't, it just, it just blew my mind. Like there was more to veganism than just not eating meat and dairy. How much water it takes just to make a burger and all the, the methane and the stuff that caused the greenhouse gases. And just, it, it's just, I, I love animals as well. So we just, it took me all this time, like 2015, for me to realise that I'm eating, like if I saw the, the sheep there or a pig or whatever, I couldn't kill it. So if I can't kill it, then why should I be allowed to eat it? You know, I've got a dog, let me, love him to bits. Somebody was going to cook it, might go absolutely fucking bonkers. So after watching it, I just went, right, that's it. I'm just going to stop. And I, I went vegan the next day uh, and started cooking because you had to start learning how to cook without any meat on your plate because I did used to eat quite a lot of meat, meat and veg or whatever it was. Um, and that then sort of brought me back into cooking and my love for cooking. And that's what I studied when I left school. When I left school, I went to college for two years to become a chef. Uh, I had a bit of a bad experience so, so uh, I worked at a Persian restaurant in Cardiff in City Road and the manager was just a proper bully and he bullied me and yeah, I, yeah it was just a really shitty time so so much so my father wanted to go around there and absolutely batter him but um, obviously my mother, my mother stopped him from doing it but um, it, just, it just put me off the industry. And then I started cleaning windows and I was skateboarding at the time as well. It worked for me because I wasn't working as many hours. Uh, but then I started cooking again and I thought, well, let's, let's, do, let's, you know, let's do a YouTube video. And I was looking at a lot, lot cause I was looking for ideas and stuff for vegan recipes and everything on, on YouTube and on, online. And every YouTube channel that I went on for vegan recipes, that's, Fucking boring. I'm talking about good, great recipes and stuff, but the people presenting them was just, just like, I was like, right, let's do it, let's have a laugh. So I contacted um, uh, Pete and James, two, two friends, and uh, they, 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 they liked the idea. So we started, we hired a Airbnb somewhere in Gloucester, which had a nice little you know, yeah, dressed up in fancy dress and stuff, just made some recipes, cooked them. And we had a laugh too, and it? it was great. And um, from that then, BBC came knocking. So I had a meeting with BBC. Uh, we hooked up with a company called One Tribe uh, Productions. Came up with an idea, which was called Dirty Vegan. 
and they commissioned it. And we went out filming the two, two, basically the whole show was about me convincing uh, people, uh, people like um, ice hockey players, uh, a women's rugby team, uh, school kids at a school about uh, the benefits of a vegan diet, especially a sport. Uh, but kids with their brains and stuff thinking. Uh, and it was just, and I go and meet scientists as well. So they'd sort of give me, give you the science behind the food and uh, the, stuff, the vitamins, the minerals and everything, which is in the vegan diet. And it, and it worked really well. It was a really good show. I really enjoyed doing it, especially doing stuff for the, the devils, proper meat eating guys, cooked food for them. They enjoyed it. So the first, the first series, it just sort of all happened. It's, it went fucking crazy. Oh, literally, as soon as she said, we've got the, the show, we started filming for it. But at the same time, I wanted to do the Wild Band to Wire Man, which is to become the first person to do the um, triathlon around Wales. So I jump in the sea in Penarth, swim th th 25 miles to Porth Call in the sea, get out to Porth Call, cycle following the whole coastal path of Wales, taking in Anglesey as well, and then stopping at the very end, and then running off his dike down to Cardiff and finishing the Cardiff Marathon. That was the challenge. So I was trying to train for that. A film for Dirty Vegan 1, which the days were really long because nobody had filmed the cooking show before. Uh, and then I got told, oh, there's, um, they want to do a book. Oh, I, thought, I, haven't, I haven't got time to fart. <laughs> so I used some of the I used some of the recipes that I did on my YouTube channel for the first book, and then it went. When did it go? I think it was two thousand and seventeen. Uh, hit the screens. It was the first vegan show ever to hit the UK TV, which I was quite proud about. And went out vegan re two thousand seventeen, and did, did pretty well. And, then we filmed the second one then. Mm -hmm. It's a good laugh. From some career, brother. And yeah. from what you're doing now from knowing from the Dirty Sanchez party boy to then becoming vegan, traveling the world, it's unbelievable. You can see your eyes are clearer, your skin's clearer. That's just only the start. I believe you had your prime in your 40s, your 50s. Like there's people out there doing marathons in their 80s. Like there's no limits to where you want to go in life. There's no limits to how far you can go. It's just all down to this, to try yeah. and quiet this down a wee bit and find a focus and, and and truly go for it. For anybody watching, brother, that's maybe in the struggle just now, what advice would you give for them? For people struggling? Yeah. It's quite funny you say that because I was speaking to my fiance, uh, was it yesterday or the day before? And she's told me to mention, she said, you need to bring this up in your podcast and stuff because, um, oh, this <clears throat> makes me quite, um, sorry, makes me quite emotional. That's okay, me. brother. But uh, <clears throat> I get quite a lot of messages off people saying that they're struggling on um, your Instagram, various platforms and stuff. And they say, you know, yeah, what, what have you got any advice? You know, and I try my best to answer every single one of them, but you just would not believe how many people out there at the moment are struggling with drugs, drink, uh, mental health, loads of stuff. And obviously a lot of them know that I've been through that myself. But uh, I don't know, it's for, I mean, the only message I've got for people out there is just, you know, don't, don't give up, just, I know it's tough, I know it's hard. We've all been there, well, you've been there. Uh, a lot of us have. You've just gotta, you just gotta keep fucking trucking, man. Don't chuck the towel in. Cause it may be a bad day today, but tomorrow will be an even better day. And if you put the effort in, you put the hard work in and you don't stop, you'll root the awards. So just, um, and like I said earlier as well, it's pretty easy to look after yourself, but your trainers on. Yeah. Go for a run or even a walk if you can run. Yeah, nature's look after, key. Look after yourself. The exercise is key for playing. Yeah. Listen, brother, for coming on today and tell your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I followed you for for years back to Dirty Sanchez days, and even now, I think you're an inspiration for what you're doing. Your fiance, your mum, must be so proud of you for everything that you are achieving. And sometimes I don't think 
you give yourself the credit that you have, you do deserve from what you've came from the dark times. Listen, no matter how many runs you do, how many rows you do around the world, we still battle, including myself. I work hard because it's it keeps me sane to a certain degree, even though it's making me insane, it's still keeping me balanced that I feel as if I'm achieving something. Will we ever be truly satisfied? I don't ever think so. But as long as we can keep pushing ourselves and leaving the blueprint for other people to then make better changes in our life from drink abuse, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, whatever the fuck it is, overeating people, undereating, people are really struggling. And if we can be at the forefront and try and make changes and try and be honest with our own lives and our own struggles, then other people will find inspiration from that. But for yeah. yourself to keep pushing on and 10 Ironmans and rowing the fucking Atlantic, it's unbelievable. Uh, do you realise what you've actually achieved or do you still doubt yourself? Still doubt myself. Yeah, that's crazy, brother. Yeah, but um, uh, the self-confidence and everything is terrible. Mm -hmm. And I still doubt myself. But like, like you just... You just keep keep S pushing, don't you? Keep swimming. Yeah, yeah just keep yeah. swimming, don't yeah. sink. Keep swimming. Brother, Cheers, thoroughly man. enjoyed it and I genuinely looking forward to you and looking forward to Thanks. seeing what you do for the rest of your journey. Thanks very much. God man. bless you. Cheers, bro. Check out more of my podcasts on the right. And be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.